You've probably seen them around. You know, the tower with the white dome. They kind of look like a giant golf ball. Want to see how the government creates hurricanes? Yes, it's true, but you won't hear Dane Wigington talking about it. He's expressing concerns about the geoengineering and solar radiation management program in place for some time for the purpose of cooling the planet. But I don't think that's going on at all. Does Dane not see the push behind the climate change agenda that hasn't slowed one bit this past decade? Do yourself a favor and while you're keeping one eye on Dane Wigington, apply your full attention to Clifford Carnicom and his research, as well as Michael Murphy and what he has to say. I have personal experience working with Clifford and can attest to his utter and astonishing commitment to professionalism and honesty. Clifford isn't likely to tell you exactly what's going on because he likely doesn't know with any certainty or enough certainty to tell you. I followed and observed Michael Murphy and find him highly credible and worthy of respect as well. I think it's telling that the Joe Rogan hit piece on geoengineering featured Mick West among its expertologist good guys and Michael Murphy as its drive-by kook in the dunk tank. Had Dane been chosen as the sacrificial geoengineering guy, I would have eased my criticism of him a bit. Clifford Carnicom simply wasn't an option because he wouldn't have been responsive to their request. He has far too much real work to do and things to learn himself. This brief video documentary will present the theory that weather is being manipulated and even created intentionally, even including hurricanes. The perpetrators are the usual people to look at, namely those with the money, the authority, the motives, and the protection of plausible deniability. Yes, I'm speaking of the United States government. As we seem to find whenever we attempt to understand the nature of various conspiracies, there's some cooperation taking place in this case. As part of what we'll be looking at as the partial mechanism for this weather control and creation is weather radar, there's some involvement by the media by either knowingly helping to conceal these efforts or by simply looking the other way or not understanding how it all works. The very best source of comprehensive analysis and reports on this theory of weather control and creation is Weather War 101. His or her work can be found on the YouTube channel Weather War 101 and at the website weatherwar101.com. The work by this person is extensive and they do a much better job of explaining what I'm going to attempt to in this brief video. However, they explain all of this over a longer series of videos and through articles that delve into complex areas. Overall, I hope that my efforts by producing this video will help to draw attention to the issue and cause people to quickly migrate to Weather War 101 for more in-depth information. But we're a fickle and impatient society. Eventually, somebody's going to have to spell this out in a 30-second soundbite, and that person isn't going to be me. One goal I had in addition to explaining this theory was to attempt to use evidence that was current or very recent. So I chose to analyze the recent hurricane, Hurricane Joaquin. Plus, I figured it might get more interest to show how this manufactured weather isn't only mild influence or used to create storm fronts. In this case, a full-on hurricane was created, and I believe it was done intentionally. I will explain that I don't have any theory as to why a hurricane would be manufactured, but that should help us focus on the evidence itself and not attempt to find evidence we expect to find. And I'm sure many viewers or others could or have already determined a motive. Before I lose everyone's interest, let's go now to the satellite footage of the recent hurricane and begin to examine some anomalies. I personally retrieved the individual image files from the period starting on September 23rd and ending on October 3rd. So what we're seeing here is obviously a time-lapse series that condenses 11 days into about 18 seconds at 30 frames per second. The hurricane doesn't really become obvious until about the 11 second mark and forms just north of the Bahamas, northeast of Cuba. It turns out that we're going to take a closer look at Cuba during this analysis. But before we do that, I want to divert your attention to something that will be helpful in understanding how weather is controlled or created. 
I'm going to show you two very short clips of footage taken at two different power plants. One is a coal-fired power generator plant, and the other, I believe, is a nuclear power plant. Whether the power plant runs on burning coal, natural gas, or the heat produced by nuclear energy, all plants of these kinds must ventilate exhaust gases at times. Solar energy plants also must do this. I don't want to oversimplify the process, but one easy way to picture how a power plant produces energy, in the case of nuclear power, for example, is to first understand that some kind of force must be produced to rotate a turbine. The rotation of the turbine acts as the generator and produces the desired electricity. How a nuclear power plant does this is by using the heat produced by the nuclear processes to heat water into steam. The force of the steam is then used to rotate the turbine. In all cases, steam remaining after being used as efficiently as possible must be vented. In the cases where pollutants are found in the overall exhaust, scrubbers and other means are used to bring the exhaust into compliance with various regulations. The frequency of what they sometimes call steam blowing varies, but often must be done every day. If you live in a large enough city to have a power plant, it's likely to be in a very industrialized area at the outskirts of the city or beyond the city limits. I recall years ago that when traveling east from the San Francisco Bay Area in the direction of Lake Tahoe, for instance, I'd pass through the area of heavy industry. When I happened to be passing through at night, that's when I'd notice the increased exhaust plumes. Now, after seeing those clips and observing for yourself the sheer volume of water vapor along with the other gases being essentially injected into the lower atmosphere, do you think there was enough there to produce a cloud or two? Bear in mind that some of these plants are larger and produce even more water vapor. This is key to the overall theory that the weather is being controlled and created. An essential component of the system needed to do so is this water vapor being produced not just by one, but by many hundreds of plants throughout the U.S. alone. The next absolutely critical component of the overall weather control and creation system is radar. You may hear terms like Doppler radar or pulse wave radar, C-band, polarimetric radar, dual polarization, but all of those terms relate to what's universally known as NEXRAD. That basically denotes Next Generation Radar System, specifically the WSR-88D system. This is a phased array radar antenna, and as you can see, it's pretty big. 12 feet by 12 feet, with 4,352 elements, to collect weather radar data. This is my research radar. When installed in the field, a radar would have four panels that look something like this. Did you note the enormity of that radar panel and its militaristic appearance? 
The National Weather Service makes no effort to conceal that the history and legacy of radar in the U.S. and worldwide was the work of the Defense Department. In fact, the existing NEXRAD network of towers in the U.S. and internationally are the property of the Defense Department. Although they do a good job of confusing the issue by interjecting all the agencies that make use of the data, such as the Department of Commerce, the FAA, the Department of Transportation, etc. Because their stated mission is to forecast weather conditions and potential emergencies, few, if any, people in meteorology or related areas have reason to suspect anything else is going on. For God's sake, it couldn't be imagined that the very severe and deadly weather they purport to warn us about could sometimes be their handiwork. They're even seen as one of the more generous departments of government because they make the data they collect freely available to the public. Wow, imagine that. Stuff we pay for being made available to us. What's next? Paying a contractor to build a backyard gazebo and actually being allowed to take possession of and use it? Rather than make a clumsy effort to explain how both the water vapor generation and the radar are combined to create weather conditions, I'm going to play a short clip produced by Weather War 101 that in many ways is a crash course. But be aware that this is just a clip taken from the middle of a lengthier video and there's a lot to see and absorb taking place. But I think if you look for the markers, pointers, and boxes provided to help identify what's being seen, you'll get the picture. You can always rewind and replay a section, and I encourage everyone to follow the links provided in the description below to Weather War 101's channel and the full clips.
right there was a stellar example and obviously took a lot of tedious work. As I said, I won't attempt to explain in greater detail these processes and instead encourage you to visit Weather War 101 on YouTube for that information. However, I do want to take a stab at analyzing some elements seen in the recent hurricane footage we previewed earlier. What I noticed in the satellite imagery of this hurricane forming poses new questions and keeps us on our toes. To focus on this, I'm only going to show the white colored precipitation layer. In the general area of interest, I've marked the location of each NEXRAD radar installation in this orange color. For some added perspective, I've marked the four nuclear power stations in Florida and one in Georgia in this bright red color. The area I'd like to focus on is Cuba, shown by the arrow coming in from the bottom right here. What I suggest looking at is the sudden bursts of white precipitation seemingly in union, because I thought it would be interesting to check the frequency or pulse of these bursts. I'm setting a timeline above and running a counter for reference. The counter will pause just until the first notable burst, okay? Now at each burst I've flagged the timeline until about 11 seconds in, when the effect becomes somewhat indistinguishable. Now that was kind of a real-time explanation, so let's run through those first 11 or 12 seconds again and simply note the bursts and the frequency at which they appear. Okay, so in my opinion, there's a distinct and pronounced group of points in Cuba where water vapor is emanating. The geography of Cuba, the location of the island, and small size would indicate a somewhat consistent climate, and it does have a consistent climate. However, it appears that October is the month of highest precipitation and rainfall. October is also the month of the least sunlight. So the fact that clouds are forming in late September into October while hurricane conditions are forming near the island isn't unusual. But the pulsing frequency of the vapor bursts seemed possibly deliberate and didn't match closely enough to the daytime-nighttime cycle. But the most unusual aspect when considering Cuba and water vapor generation is that Cuba has no nuclear reactor power plants and no large fuel or gas-powered plants. Cuba has a surprising number of hydroelectric dams the difference there being that no heat is required to power the turbines and therefore no steam is generated. Solar and wind have also been growing sources of electricity. For the most part, however, Cuba has made do with a few models of portable diesel fuel generators that produce less than 2 or even 1 megawatt and produce very little exhaust gases or vapor as a consequence. So ultimately, without knowing more about possible vapor sources and without viewing the radar activities, it's not possible to tell if there's anything unusual going on here. It may be that the water vapor has another, more commonplace explanation. I think I've covered as much as I could hope to without getting into the areas I'm unqualified to explain. Weather War 101 and others can provide more fascinating information about this apparent conspiracy. There's a lot I've left to be explained and other aspects to consider, such as motive, related sciences, repercussions, and how this all may relate to both the climate change agenda and the controversial aerosol spraying or chemtrails phenomenon. It's very possible that I will produce either a video or podcast on topics like these as a follow-up to this video. Initially, I thought I'd conclude this by giving my opinion on the greater implications of forces in our world controlling and creating weather. But considering how much this seems like a continuation or ex extension of other disputed conspiracies, people who tend to consider these alternative views can surely figure out for themselves where to file this information. I'd estimate that the control and creation of weather, if it is in fact taking place, didn't begin recently and doesn't target or pose a risk to any single part of life. Either the damage has been done or the really bad effects are still to come, but the sense I have is that the impact on our reality has been widespread but subtle. <clears throat> 
As I've briefly mentioned at times in the past, my concerns have always been more about bioengineering than geoengineering. I'm very interested to learn where these two fields meet and how what I've discussed in this video might coincide with bioengineering. I've had a project folder for a few years on a topic within this area. In fact, uh, so it's likely that I'll produce something once I can complete the project. What I recommend people do in response to this conspiracy, if they come to any strong conclusion supporting these actions are taking place, is not very different than what I suggest in many other serious matters. Step back and get the most realistic picture of where we stand and where the power players stand. Authority and the secrecy it affords, the U.S. government, is antisocial, to put it mildly. Steps will have to be taken, but the challenge will be enormous considering all that we have to do and all that they have to lose. The good news is, were any domino to fall in their toolbox or memory chest of big deceptions, the whole thing will collapse into itself. The not-so-good news is that the solutions are likely going to involve creativity and maybe even genius, both of which are being stamped out and harder to find in America.